الآن ننتقل إلى الجلسة المقبلة وهي تحت عنوان تمكين إنشاء روابط بين المستثمرين وقطاع الأعمال فأرجو من السادة المشاركين في هذه الجلسة التوجه إلى المسرح السيد عمر أحمد باحليوة وكما هو موجود في الجدول أيضا معالي الدكتور توفيق بن فوزان الربيعة السيد مارك أوتي والدكتور سعيد بن عبد الله الشيخ والدكتور بطرس كلينك والسيد كلود سماجا والسيدة جوانا ريس والسيد إدوارد بيرتو كما هو واضح القاعة مليئة في الحضور المشاركين نعتذر فقط معالي دكتور توفيق بن فوزان الربيع لن يشارك في هذه الجلسة ولا أي السيد مارك أوتي أيضا اسمحوا لي الآن أن أقدم السيد عمر أحمد بلحليوة وهو مدير الجلسة وهو بالتالي سيعرف ضيوف المشاركين فيها المهندس عمر أحمد باحليوة أمين عام لجنة التجارة الدولية يتولى حاليا منصب الأمين العام للجنة التجارة الدولية للمملكة العربية السعودية ويعد من الشخصيات البارزة في مجتمعات الأعمال على المستويين المحلي والدولي ويتمتع بخبرة واسعة وشبكة كبيرة من العلاقات في المجتمعين المحلي والدولي التي تؤهله لتعزيز العلاقات بين المؤسسات ويتلخص دوره الحالي في تعزيز ودعم صورة المملكة العربية السعودية على الصعيد الدولي من خلال رئاسة مختلف البعثات لأوروبا وأمريكا الشمالية وغيرها من دول منظمة التعاون الاقتصادي والتنمية باختصار أيضا يعمل السيد بحليوة عن كثب مع معارفه في مجتمع الأعمال على المستويين المحلي والدولي لتعزيز الصادرات وجذب الاستثمارات الأجنبية المباشرة للمملكة العربية السعودية وتم اختياره كواحد من القادة في المملكة في الكتاب الذي أصدرته مؤسسة ليدرز لنشر للعامين 2007 و 2011 تولى مناصب إدارية في مختلف الشركات من بينها محلل تقني أول في صندوق السعودي للتنمية الصناعية ومدير في مصانع المعجل لأكياس التعبئة ونائب رئيس المبيعات والتسويق للشركة السعودية للصادرات الصناعية ومدير عام شركة ماكت ومساعد أمين عام الشؤون الأجنبية لمجلس الغرف التجارية الصناعية السعودية ويتولى حالياً كما أشرنا منصب أمين عام الغرفة التجارية الصناعية السعودية وأمين عام لجنة التجارة الدولية رحبوا معي بالمهندس عمر وبالمشاركين في هذه الجلسة شكراً أخي محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أرحب فيكم في الجلسة الثالثة اليوم إن شاء الله ومقدما اعتذر بالنيابه عن معالي وزير التجاره والصناعه انه اضطر يسافر الى جنوب افريقيا عندهم اللجنه السعوديه الافريقيه جنوب افريقيه فللاسف يعني لم يستطع الحضور وبالنيابه عن غرفه جده والاخوان الحضور اعتذر عن حضور معالي الوزير ولكن يوجد كوكبه من المفكرين والخبراء والاقتصاديين في هذه الجلسة وأرجو أن نستمتع جميعا بالإنصات والاستفادة من خبراتهم المحلية والدولية على يميني سعادة الدكتور هنبدأ بالدكتور سعيد عبد الله الشيخ وهو عضو مجلس شورى وكبار كبير اقتصاديين في البنك الأهلي إضافة إلى خبرات كثيرة وطويلة في المملكة العربية السعودية يلي السيد كلود سماجا المؤسس والرئيس لسماجا سماجا الاستشارات الاستراتيجية وهو الرئيس السابق للوورد إيكنامك فورم وهو أشهر المؤسسات المؤتمراتية على مستوى العالم 
ثم يلي سيد بطرس كلينك وهو الرئيس التنفيذي لبنك ستاندرد شارد في المملكه العربيه السعوديه ثم السيده جوانا ريس عضو مجلس اداره اندي فور العالميه من سان فرانسيسكو ثم السيد ادوارد بيرتون ادوارد الرئيس التنفيذي لمجلس الاعمال السعودي الامريكي في واشنطن يلي اخيرا وليس باخرا السيد جون هوب براينت وهو المؤسس ورئيس ورئيس رئيس مجلس الاداره والرئيس التنفيذي لمجموعة Operation Hope في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية فسنبدأ اليوم إن شاء الله بالبرزنتيشن أو عروض من الأخوة الموجودين ثم نتلقى مساءلات واستفسارات الجمهور والتداخل معهم وبعد ذلك هناك خمسة أسئلة سيكون عبارة عن يعني voting عليها إن شاء الله فنتمنى تفاعلكم فيها فيتفضل سادة الدكتور سعيد لإلقاء الكلمة تفضل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor to be here speaking to such distinguished audience. And before I start, I'd like to extend my appreciation to uh, Jeddah Chambers of Commerce, Jeddah Economic Forum, for inviting me to be speaking to you this afternoon. Also, I want to extend my appreciation to the chairman of this session, my dear friend, Omar Bahlewa. What I have for you today is something that I would share with you regarding the developments in Saudi economy. I would touch briefly on the global economy just to set the context as I move and talk about the Saudi economy. So the outlook, the outline for my presentation, brief on the global economy, oil and budgetary developments, economic growth forecasts, monetary developments and financial markets. On the global economy scene, we see the world economy to be improving as we move in 2014. IMF projection for 2014 at 3.7% compared to 3% of last year, 2013. The world is moving at multi-stage growth. Advancing economies are recovering. Emerging economies are moderating. Europe is improving. It's coming from a recession to a slow recovery. One thing important that happened over mid-year last year with the announcement of the U.S. Federal Reserve to start tapering or scaling down the stimulus packages, and we see a divergence in the interest rate between emerging economies and developed uh, economies. Those emerging economies at the top, as we see the interest rates to be rising, while it remains to be accommodative for uh, advanced economies, whether that is ECB or Federal Reserve or Bank of England. Yield has changed, so the yield has been shifting upward. Gold last year was a safe haven, not anymore. Depressed or fell by 28%, recovered over the last month or so. On your right-hand side, the chart for gold. Inflation has dropped last year, but started to rise uh, since uh, late uh, of last year uh, until now. Uh, the implication on currencies had been tremendous with the tapering. We see currencies such as Brazilian real losing 15% since January 2013 up till now. Also, lira has lost, Turkish lira lost 20%. Commodities edged downward last year as the dollar was strengthening following the announcement of tapering. Uh, petroleum remained stable. And I emerge, the economy, the stock markets of the world, if we look to emerging markets, they contracted uh, by nearly 9% since January 2013, while uh, the MS, MSCCI for the world gained nearly 20%. Now I move uh, to Saudi economy, I would start with the oil. And at the background of this slide, the gray, you see the level of production in Saudi Arabia for last year was averaging 9.6 million barrels a day. We're expecting 
production to be in the range of 9.4 million barrels a day. Also, we're expecting prices to edge downward from an average of $106 a barrel as of last year to $100 a barrel this year. More likely, the tension, especially as it relates to Iran and Libya, will ease in the second half, and that's why we're expecting you know, production by Saudi Arabia to sort of coming down as more production will be coming from Libya as well as from Iran. So this is the oil scenario. Now, this has important implications on the fiscal accounts of Saudi Arabia and the current account. As of last year, 2013, the, fisc the current account balance was nearly 23% to GDP and fiscal account balance at 14% of, or at 7.4, I'm sorry, of GDP last year, 2013, and 17.4% for the current account. We're expecting that to be coming down in 2014 at 13.9 for the current account, the surpluses, uh, the balance of payment, and also for the fiscal account to be at 0.7% to GDP due to lower prices and lower production. Now, what you have in this table is the uh, budget, announced budget for 2014, projecting uh, a balanced budget, 855 billion for expenditure, as well as 80, 855 for revenues. However, we're projecting revenues to rise to 973 billion Saudi Rials, and at the same time, we're projecting expenditure to be at 953 with a surplus of 20 billion Saudi Rials, certainly much lower than the surplus of last year at 206 billion uh, Saudi Rials largely attributed to the lower level of production as well as lower prices and at the same time rising expenditure by government. The government over the last few years followed uh, a policy, a uh, fiscal policy that focused on three aspects, accelerating expenditures with the emphasis on capital expenditure. And what you see in this slide is the upper component is the capital expenditure. The orange is showing the current expenditure. So the level of expenditure, total expenditure last year, the actual expenditure amounted to 925 billion Saudi Rials, 278 billion Saudi Rials spent on infrastructure, whether social infrastructure or physical infrastructure. We're expecting as of this year, the level of capital expenditure to amount to 238 billion Saudi Riyadh. So that's the first policy development or fiscal uh, policy aspect. Uh, with the announced budget, five major sectors receive nearly 53% of the overall budget. Education was on top at 206 billion Saudi Riyadh, health uh, and social affairs, uh, 106 billion Saudi Riyadh. Uh, municipality, and then transportation and infrastructure, and water and agriculture, and manufacturing. And these uh, are, are shown in the chart, accounting for 53% uh, of the overall 855. So there, is, there has been an emphasis, of course, on education, manpower, on health, as you see in this chart for the sectoral distribution of the Saudi budget. A second important fiscal policy was to retire, to retire the public debt over the last few years. Public debt dropped from nearly 100% in 2002 to 2.7% of GDB in 2013. In terms of value, it is amounting for 75 billion Saudi riyals. However, this sort of helped the kingdom to uh, gain an upgrading by, uh, recently by Fetch, which uh, put a sovereign rating for the kingdom at AA with a stable outlook. The third uh, aspect of the fiscal policy is to build reserves. And what you see in this chart is the uh, growth of the net foreign assets of the kingdom amounted to $757 billion by the end of last year nearly 2.7 trillion Saudi Rials. 1.7 trillion is the government reserves. The remaining 1 trillion is the 
amount held by Sama as a cover for Saudi Riyals. With the presence of such sizable reserves, the government will be able to manage any adverse developments in oil and to carry through with its expenditure program at least for two or three years. If there is any adverse developments or negative developments in the oil market. But one had also to pay attention to the fiscal policy. As we have seen in the last few years, fiscal policy has been expansionary, but at the same time, we see an overrun in the budget. The gray component is showing the additional expenditure year after year until we reach the 925 billion Saudi riyals as of last year. One thing, one thing that we had to be watchful as we move forward and, and careful about it because it is going to be difficult if oil prices were to assume a negative direction and whether the government would be able to carry on with this level of spending with lower oil prices and lower oil production if production to be rising from neighboring countries in the region, Iraq, Iran, Libya, and also with the uh, fast development of shale oil in the U.S. Uh, and also other parts of the world. Uh, in this chart, what I'm trying to show is a contrast between the implicit price and the Saudi budget in the period 2007 all the way to 2009, when the implicit price for the budget was nearly $40, $45 a barrel. That has changed to nearly $79, $82 a barrel, which is the price they assume in the budget, basically when putting the preliminary budget. The break-even that is expected for this year, 2014, would reach $87 a barrel, which would mean if oil prices fall below $87 a barrel, then we'll be running into deficit. More likely, we'll be maintaining the $100 a barrel, so we're still in surplus, but one had to be careful as we're seeing this direction to be rising from the $40 to $87 a barrel. Now, as far as growth, we've seen the overall GDP growth moderating in 2013 to 3.8% uh, from previous year of uh, nearly uh, 42 or 4.3%, and of course much lower than 8% of 2011. This is in real terms. However, this contraction or this deceleration in growth was attributed to the con small contraction in the oil sector at 0.6%. Much of the growth was coming from the non-oil private and non-oil public. If we look to the non-oil sector, then oil sector growth was reasonable or good at 5.5% uh, in 2013, expected to be at the same level in 2014. The drivers for that growth was coming from construction, uh, private services, and manufacturing. These are the three sectors that are driving economic growth so far and uh, more uh, in, the, in the past few years and more likely in the, in the coming years as well. An important development also would uh, relate to the level of spending on infrastructure and also on productive assets. Uh, total contracts awarded uh, in 2013 amounted to 294 billion Saudi Riyal, the largest in the history of the kingdom to have that amount of contracts awarded in a single year. And if we look for the level of contracts awarded over the last about four or five years, we're talking about nearly 1.2 two trillion Saudi riyals worth of contracts awarded. Obviously, this, this is already generating or helping in generating economic growth by creating demand and goods and services, and at the same time will increase the capacity of the Saudi economy, especially as it relates to infrastructure or productive sectors such as petrochemicals, steel, aluminums, and others. Now, let me talk about the monetary developments. Of course, being with Saudi Riyal being sort of linked to the dollar, monetary policy more or less is following the U.S. Uh, uh, Federal Reserve policy. And we see the cyber rate to be at around 1% over the last few years, and uh, at, at least uh, since 2011 onward, is around the 1%. Uh, Sama has issued the Treasury notes to absorb uh, some of the liquidity or excess liquidity in the market, but we, see, we have seen lending to be rising by 12%. Level of inflation, 
moderated recently at 3%, three percent, it remains to be supported by, especially at the beginning of the year, by imported uh, inflation with the reversal in the uh, 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 global inflation index, and at the same time with the rental cost, which is local, that is continuing to rise at 3.5% year on year. Lending and important developments, of course, and contributing to the growth of the private sector, the incremental lending as of 2013 amounted to nearly 116 billion Saudi rials, at around 12%. And if we look to lending by economic activities, we find manufacturing, commerce, and consumers, these that are uh, exceeding the remaining, are accounting for the largest shares of the total lending. Total lending amounted to 1.1 trillion Saudi rials. Consumer lending amounted to 340 billion Saudi rials. Manufacturing, 139, and commerce, around 220 billion. Building and constructions at around 80 billion Saudi rials. All of them showed the growth from previous year. So 2013 were on a higher level than 2012. Now let me talk briefly about the Saudi stock market. We've seen the index to be gaining 25% last year, very much influenced uh, by what happened at the global level when we have seen the Dow to be rising by 29%. Uh, Even though the level of the volume of trading remained stable last year at around 5 billion Saudi rial. Since the beginning of the year, so the index has moved by yeah. nearly uh, uh, 10% or 9%. Uh, um, uh, and we're seeing this uh, increase to be um, uh, fast. Uh, hopefully that we'll see some correction and not continuing at the same trend. So we, that should not be leading to a serious or a sharp uh, correction. The PE ratios are exceeding the level of 16 uh, multiples at this time. And uh, if, if this were to continue, if this trend were to continue throughout the year, then obviously we'll be uh, running it through uh, major corrections, but hopefully that we'll see some ma some corrections moving forward. Degree now, 10, IPO Degree 10. okay, IPOs uh, since 2008 has been stagnant. Very little uh, activity in the IPO market, initial public offerings. As of last year, 2013, the amount raised was 1.9 uh, billion Saudi rials, five issuances. Certainly, that's not helping. Hopefully, there will be more, uh, more IPOs coming in order to reduce the pressure that we have seen in the previous slide with the stock market. The bond market, or Sukuk issuances, had done very well. Saudi Arabia came second after Malaysia with $15 billion uh, worth of issuances. Uh, GACA, uh, 15 billion Saudi rials, Sadara, 7.5 billion, and even SEC, SEC issued uh, 3.75 uh, billion Saudi rials, uh, a 30 year uh, uh, bon, uh, sukuk. Uh, uh, the one thing that is noticeable here is the size of the global market, which is 74 uh, billion dollars, and Saudi Arabia came second after Malaysia. With that, I conclude my presentation, and thank you very much. شكرا دكتور سعيد اقتصاد قوي اقتصاد ضخم جدا أكبر اقتصاد في الشرق الأوسط ما نحتاج له هو تعظيم الاستفادة من معطيات هذا الاقتصاد والاستفادة من الخبرات الدولية وعلى هذا الأساس هنالك كوكبة من الخبراء الدوليين. فلو تسمحوا لي نعطي الفرصة لسيد كلاود سماجا ليعطينا فكرة. كلاود the floor is yours please. Thank you very much, Omar. I would like first of all to thank the Jeddah Economic Forum for making the giving me the honor uh, to speak in front of you today and for their invitation. I would like also to congratulate the Jeddah Economic Forum because I think the theme of this forum, growth through youth, is absolutely essential. It is spot on and it is a priority not only for a country like Saudi Arabia, but for many, many countries around the world. 
Now, let me start with three basic realities. Number one, reality. Real growth and real jobs creation comes through entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are the only people, the only category which creates growth, which creates jobs. Number two, basic reality. In every country in the world, finance is the most important, the most difficult challenge that entrepreneurs have to overcome to transform an idea or a project into a business reality. Basic reality number three, finance is a problem, but, but on many occasions, the finance exists. The potential financing exists. The challenge is to connect finance with entrepreneurs. And I would like to quote the former chairman of the NASDAQ, David Welt, when he said, if we cannot put the money into the hands of the people who create jobs, then we will not have a very bright future. So this is very crucial. Now that I have set the stage, let me tell you about the three key aspects in linking investors, linking finance to entrepreneurs. The number one key component is, of course, as we are speaking about finance, to have deep enough and diversified enough financial markets. We know today, from the last 50 years of experience, that to have the process of creative destructions that create growth, meaning by that new companies, new technologies coming up and displacing old technologies, old companies, to have this process to work, you need to have a good financial system. You need to have deep financial markets. Of course, banks can provide money to entrepreneurs, but we know that banks in that respect play a kind of limited role. What you need to create, what you need to find are structures, for instance, of venture capital. We know that what has made the success of the US economy of Silicon Valley has been a very strong, very wide basis structure of venture capital. Europe has been creating this basis of venture capital. Latin America has, in the last few years, developed that structure. We know that the MENA region is lagging behind. Of course, it is now starting to catch up, but the structure of venture capital is absolutely a key element to develop in the coming years. But beyond that, what we see today, which is very important, are new modes of financing for entrepreneurs and startups. You have now a development of a trend of peer-to-peer -peer financing, individual connecting with entrepreneurs and financing their project. And the latest innovation is what is called crowdfunding. It is a system through which, through websites, entrepreneurs are communicating their projects and you have hundreds or even thousands of very small investors in a way, being convinced that this is a good project, and the amount of money that can be accumulated is then enough to transform a project 
into a commercial reality. Just to give you an idea, it is estimated that in 2013, there were $5 billion of transaction through this new system of crowdfunding. Of course, it requires technology, it requires social framework, it requires regulatory framework, but this is something that in this part of the world, for instance, could provide a very good way of leapfrogging to provide financing to entrepreneurs. But, but, of course you have the websites, you have the digital, but what is essential is to create the platforms where would-be investors and would-be entrepreneurs can come together face to face. This is why an initiative like the Jeddah Economic Forum is so important, and I think there should be much more Jeddah Economic Forum, not only in Jeddah, but in the country and throughout the region. In fact, these platforms are essential. Just to give you an example, I had been invited twice to speak in Barcelona to an annual event which is designed to bring together face-to-face, -to -face, sitting across the table, would-be entrepreneurs and would-be investors. This is what some activities of the World Economic Forum are trying to do. This is, for instance, what we do with the Mexico Business Summit in Mexico, where we bring every year 80 entrepreneurs to meet with investors and to also communicate and learn from global business leaders. Last but not least, in this network that you need to create is the importance of clusters. If I take one example in Saudi Arabia, we have the King Abdulaziz uh, Knowledge and Technology City, which will become the host for the Global Center for, uh, for Business uh, Activities, for new business activities. This is the kind of clusters that are very important. If you look at Switzerland, for instance, the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale has created a cluster to bring young entrepreneurs and it is providing a tremendous support. And we have seen today in my country a number of new businesses created on the basis of technology and they are beginning to flourish very much. So this notion of linking technology center and business incubators is very important. Now let me go to the third component, which is the role of government. Government has to provide support, and it is not only financial support. It is support in terms of helping strategies, helping to orient entrepreneurs, helping them to transform a project into a commercial reality. Look at the role that the Small Business Administration is playing in the US for small and medium-sized companies. Look at the role that the administration for SMEs is playing in the UK. Look at the new innovative structure that Singapore has created to promote and to help and support mm -hmm. new entrepreneurs. Look also closer to Saudi Arabia to the Tukur structure which has been created in nearby Kuwait. So this role of the state is very important because, as I said, it is finance, it is support, but it is legitimization of a project of the entrepreneurs. So you need to have these three components to come together. Financial markets, networking, platforms for networks, and the role of the government. And I will stop here, Omar, because we will get back to some point in the discussion. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Thank you, Claude. Thank you very much. Please give us an applause. نقاط مهمة جدا نستفيد من سيد كلاود لكن حنرجع لها إن شاء الله في الأسئلة والأجوبة 
وفي نقاط بالذات نقطة رأس المال الجريء اللي هو الفينشر كابيتال اللي نحتاج انه نطور فكر الفينشر كابيتال في السعودية. الآن نعطي الدور للسيد بطرس كلينك. بطرس ذا فلور از يورز بليز. عمر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Gentlemen, ladies, your excellencies, uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be here to speak at this forum on such an important topic. Uh, what I would like to do in the next few minutes is really provide you with a banker's perspective on the development of the SME sector. Uh, my bank is focused on emerging markets and we have enormous expertise uh, you know, in developing this space. It is a big focus for us. Um, the SME sector is the backbone of economic development for both developed and developing countries. Entrepreneurship, as my colleague Claude just mentioned, is essential. Uh, it improves competitiveness, it improves trade, it creates employment. Also, small organizations play such an important role in basically, uh, you know, providing innovation. Uh, they are free, they can come up with great ideas, they play a significant role in reduction of poverty and social integration. Now, when I look at the SME sector, uh, it is 95% of the enterprises globally. It is around two-thirds of the labor market. It grows around twice the growth rate of GDPs of countries. And it constitutes between 30 and 60% of GDPs in general, and it goes beyond that in certain cases. Now, when it comes to the Middle East, there are always some distinction between oil-producing countries and non-oil-producing countries. Um, the impact of SMEs is definitely larger in uh, non-oil-producing countries because it is more important to the improvement of living conditions of people. In oil-producing countries, and Saudi especially, um, one thing to look at is like the percentage of loans to SMEs by the financial institutions relative to the total uh, amount of loans. And basically, it hardly reaches 5%. If we're looking at diversifying the economy, if we are looking at welcoming a huge set of uh, young population into the labor market, uh, the SME sector of is of, you know, tremendous importance. Now, one thing to do is look at other countries and what they have done, and I would like to mention two countries that have, you, you know, that I single out because one, the SME sector has played such an important role in them becoming a uh, developed economy. Also, the government has played and a very important role in supporting the SME sector, and they have looked at it holistically. And the example that comes to mind first is really the example of South Korea, where employment in the SME sector is around 95%. Now, one thing to note is it didn't happen overnight. It was an entire, you know, over a period of around 50 years, where it started in the 60s with some basic uh, laws and regulations uh, to the second phase during the 70s or 80s, the growth phase, where it was more about localization, reduction in imports, uh, focus on exports, focus on incorporating technology, machinery, then, during the Asian crisis, they hit some tough times, and the sector really, uh, you, you know, got hurt quite significantly. But they looked at it as a way to restructure, innovate. And then, finally, we will talk a little bit more on the type of funds that were developed to provide a more stable capital. 
Um, another country that uh, you know I'd like to mention uh, due to the SME clusters that my colleague just mentioned, and it's Italy. And uh, what they have found is by grouping uh, small companies within a small zone uh, enables tremendous improvements in efficiency, coordination, cooperation, specialization, yes, competition, yes. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a much uh, better product that, uh, you, you know, is developed and it's more sustainable. Now, let me get to the financing part, which is, you know, what we look at. Um, when we talk to our clients uh, from the SME space, what are they looking for? First thing, they want access to financing. And that is, you know, as was mentioned, superbly, you know, enormously important. Now, when we look at those companies, one, they do not have collateral. They do not have sufficient capital. A lot of the applications that get presented to the banks generally get turned down. Um, and there are certain reasons behind it. One of, uh, of those reasons is, you know, they do not have organized financial statements. The second thing is there is a lack of transparency. They don't have the financial sophistication. Also, you know, in general, as we look at different countries and different countries have, you know, things change among the different countries, uh, we look at the regulatory framework. We look at the transparency and access to information, both private and public, things like bureaus, credit bureaus. Also, another important thing is the registries and uh, like uh, of the securities and the properties of those, uh, you know, companies. The second point that they look for is a business environment that is conducive to promote these great ideas. Uh, first thing is, you know, property rights, contract enforcement, tax rates, it's important. In areas where there is corruption, it impacts small companies enormously. Many of the guys at the helm of those companies, you know, lack the management experience lack the financial experience and training, lack the business experience and training. They want solutions that are simple. They want solutions that are convenient, solutions that are efficient. And let us not forget that they are going through an evolutionary phase. So they start off small, and then they move to a growth phase, and then they even become you know, more complex, and their needs change uh, along the way. So what as financial institutions do we need to do? Uh, one is to be come up with creative solutions for underwriting credit standards for SMEs. I mean, this is very, very important because if we apply the rules and the methods and policies that we have in place to small organizations, generally we will not be very successful. So uh, a, a lot of work goes in this area to ensure that we are approaching the SME space in the right way, giving them the right level of focus. But not you have one minute, please. Oh, okay. Um, another thing is the, um, like, the, the underwriting of the risk. How do we diversify the credit risk of SMEs? Another thing is we try to partner up with other organizations that provide some form of training to the small entrepreneurs. Another point that we look at is, you know, we look at the SME sector, you, you know, as one sector. It is more complex than the retail. It is less complex than the uh, corporate space. And finally, we also look at trying to provide solutions that go from the micro companies, if you will, to the growth phases, to the points where companies become a bit larger to expand overseas where they really need seamless banking throughout the process. Thank you.
شكرا بطرس شكرا جزيلا Uh, well, then, uh, Seda uh, Reese, uh, and you need the. Uh, yeah, we're. Well. Oh, we left it up there. I'll do. I'll do the uh, honor. I'll get you the. Uh, too late. <laughs> Thank you. You have nine minutes. You lost one minute. There we go. Oops, it's gone too far. Hi. Um, it, first of all, it's an honor to be here. I have been a venture capitalist for the last 15 years. I also served on the board of the National Venture Capital Association in the United States. So I spent a lot of time working with government and tr trying to bridge the gap between government and entrepreneurial development and job creation. But I'm here today representing Endeavor, a global organization that supports high-impact entrepreneurs in emerging markets. And there was a lot of talk earlier today about bureaucracy and red tape and, and entrepreneurial development. And even if you get all of that right, entrepreneurs still face uh, some incredible challenges and barriers to success. Many of them are listed here on the slide. The cost of failure, the access to capital we've talked about, the lack of trust, uh, the lack of professional development. And one thing that we know very specifically uh, with Endeavor is the lack of role models. When you have, uh, when entrepreneurs can see great role models, it really inspires them to step up and try something big. I know tomorrow you have Chris Hughes uh, from Facebook, one of the co-founders. He's a great role model in Silicon Valley, as is Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, who have really inspired the next generation of entrepreneurs. At Endeavor, we uh, have screened we, uh, 35,000 entrepreneurs over the last 17 years and selected just 880. And we recently launched in Saudi Arabia, and the bar is actually high, but uh, many we've selected already eight entrepreneurs from Saudi Arabia, so we're, we have a great start here. Those entrepreneurs in Saudi Arabia now have access to more than 3,000 mentors globally from around the world who uh, have very defined support relationships with the entrepreneurs, so it's not just within their country. We have partnerships with Harvard, Wharton, Stanford, and MIT, where we bring MBAs into the companies, as we will be doing in Saudi Arabia. We have partnerships with Bain, who's provided $25 million worth of strategic consulting pro bono to Endeavor companies, as well as Ernst & Young, who's put more than 80 fellows uh, into our companies to help support them. We also host many gatherings and uh, support functions for our entrepreneurs. And lastly, we have more than 50 venture capital funds that mentor the entrepreneurs in the process of fundraising, and then also many of them end up supporting those entrepreneurs with funds. And what we've learned is the impact can be significant. Most, when people talk about SME or SME businesses, they maybe hire two or three people. Uh, the average Endeavor entrepreneur hires more than 200. Uh, we, I like to give the example of uh, an entrepreneur in Brazil who was creating wind blades for wind technology. When we started with him, he was a very small business. Now he's the second largest producer of wind blades in the world, doing over 800 million in revenue. The other uh, key point is the average Endeavor uh, company employee makes seven times the average wage of their competitor. So it's not only significant jobs at scales, but it's jobs that pay better than uh, jobs in their field. We are in 19 countries and 43 cities around the world, and you can see that we now have uh, really started to penetrate th this region, having launched in Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Jordan, Lebanon, and Egypt and we're uh, quite excited about this growth. So one of the things that we challenged ourselves with, we said, we're providing all of this great mentorship and support, but could we come up with an investment vehicle that would fill in the last piece, which is, as other panelists have talked about, the, the lack of funding? And we did a historical look. We said, had we had a structured fund in place, over the last 10 years, based on the actual fundraising and exits of Endeavor entrepreneurs, what would the returns have been? Uh, Bain actually did this study for us, and it would have returned about three times uninvested capital. 
which would put us in top decile of growth equity funds performance, which really doesn't surprise me because we have more than 350 people around the world supporting these entrepreneurs to help them grow into you know, successful, high-impact businesses. So we came up with a structure of a fund we call Endeavor Catalyst. One of the unique aspects of it is that the profits from the fund, unlike a traditional venture capital or private equity fund, do not profit individuals. They're profits that fund the growth of the organization. So if you look at the contrast between the two, all of the profits that come to Endeavor are getting recycled back into the markets in which those entrepreneurs exist. We also set up a really unique structure with the fund. We, uh, as an entrepreneurial organization, we said it's important to keep reinventing. And unlike a traditional venture capital or private equity fund, the money, uh, we have two pieces of money that get invested in the entrepreneurs. We have a traditional limited partnership uh, that exists in many places. Uh, it's a Delaware limited partnership. But we also have a philanthropic entity. This is where people have given money as pure philanthropy. Uh, and we invest side by side. We put a tiny bit of money in from the philanthropy when we invest in the entrepreneur. Then what happens when the company has a liquidity event, either the company gets sold or has an IPO, the investor gets their pro rata share of the investment back plus a, a competitive return. And then we're able to allocate profits within the investment to the philanthropy, so the rest of the money comes to Endeavor tax-free. This has not existed in uh, this structure before. It passed the US government IRS standards, uh, even though it's, it's a tax-free entity. And it's providing investment capital for Endeavor entrepreneurs all over the world. The last piece of it is, uh, first I should mention, there's no management fees on the fund because we're really trying to align our interests with that of the investor and making sure we both share in profits at the same time. But we've enabled the fund if an investor comes from a specific Endeavor country, so I'll use the example of Saudi Arabia, if an investor invested in the fund from Saudi Arabia, when the returns are achieved, the investor gets their profits, but then the money that comes to Endeavor, half of it gets recycled and brought back into Saudi Arabia to continue to regenerate uh, new business creation and support the funding of those businesses. All yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Joanne. Thank you very much. That's very informative. Uh, what Anne uh, said at the Burton, رئيس تنفيذي لمجلس الأمن السعودي الأمريكي في الجانب الأمريكي في واشنطن. تفضل. Please. Thank you, Omar. Ladies and gentlemen, let me add my uh, words of gratitude to the Jet Economic Forum and the Jeddah Chamber of Commerce for consistently organizing and executing on uh, on very good events that not only portray the commercial and economic might of the kingdom. Uh, but also its commitment to small, medium-sized entrepreneurs uh, in the kingdom. Uh, I had the privilege and honor of living and working in the kingdom for three years. And during that time, I had the opportunity to get to know the business communities across the kingdom fairly well. And a lot is said of Silicon Valley in the United States, and a lot is said of the ecosystems that exist for small business in the United States. But I can tell you that I have viewed the same kind of creativity, innovation, and passion for business within small businesses in Saudi Arabia that I have seen uh, in other parts of the world, including the United States. So. So I think, I think when you look at institutions like Endeavor and you look at other institutions that have been operating in the kingdom that support small businesses, such as the Centennial Fund, uh, uh, even the chambers of commerce within the kingdom and the programs that they have for young Saudi entrepreneurs, men and women, I think Saudi should be very proud of what exists in terms of the infrastructure to support small and medium-sized businesses in the kingdom. Uh, speaking from the perspective, of course, of 
the U.S.-Saudi business relationship, of, of, course, of which I'm most familiar with, uh, I, I can tell you that after 20 years of existence, the U.S.-Saudi Arabian Business Council is not only committed to the majority of companies you see on its roster, which are the biggest and the best of Saudi Arabia and Fortune 500 companies in the kingdom, but we're also committed to helping small and medium-sized businesses make the linkage across the Atlantic uh, between U.S. and Saudi companies. And there is a lot to offer on both sides. Uh, just within the, the few minutes that I have, I'll mention some examples of uh, what the United States is doing. Not that Saudi Arabia has to emulate uh, the United States, but I think that we can learn from each other, and certainly when it comes to small and medium-sized businesses, uh, there are institutions and programs in place in the United States that Saudi Arabia, I think, should at least look at uh, because they, they, uh, they assist with the building blocks of successful entrepreneurs. But very briefly, in terms of what's available in the United States, most of the world, of course, is coming out of uh, recession, global economic downturn uh, over the last uh, eight years. The United States, of course, is leading the pack in coming out of that. At the end of last year, it, were, it was recorded that American companies banked an additional $130 billion in cash added to what they already had. So at the end of last year, you had cash holdings of American companies of $1.4 trillion. Now, 58% of that, about $840 billion, has been held overseas in overseas cash accounts. So American companies are flush with cash. They're in a position now, and, and you can see some of the M&A activity happening. They are looking at opportunities overseas. One of the biggest vehicles, of course, is private equity. But even if you look at private equity within the kingdom, and you have some big names here, JP Morgan, KKR, even their smallest fund, $500 million, uh, it, it does not, I think, address some of the uh, financial needs of small and medium-sized companies because most of those firms don't look at anything uh, over a hundred million dollars. So when we look at when we look at this cash and we look at this uh, unfortunately the disincentives that you find in the United States, the marginal tax, uh, marginal effective tax rate in uh, the United States is 35.3%. It's the highest in the developed world. You have an incentive for companies to look at investment vehicles here and elsewhere in the world. So what we have is a phenomenon happening in the United States where private equity now is bypassing very large deals and looking at small and medium-sized companies uh, which are actually outperforming large investments uh, and, and actually outperforming the S&P 500. So the preferred vehicle now for private equity in the United States to invest in small and medium-sized businesses are what's called business development companies. Now these are publicly traded entities in the United States uh, and since 2010, 21 of these entities have been created uh, and have been uh, raising funds totaling $2.16 billion. One minute. Uh, the, SBA, the SBA has also gotten in uh, in partnership with private equity and has actually spent and invested close to $20 billion on an annual basis in partnership with private equity uh, for what they call the small business investment company. Uh, and they are uh, committing another two to three billion dollars every year to this. This is something in terms of financing of, uh, of uh, small and medium sized companies, as well as what was mentioned earlier, the assistance in getting companies in proximity to foreign investors, something that uh, we have done on, a, on an annual basis 
this kind of assistance, including perhaps the subsidization of costs for companies to attend trade events overseas, is something that the kingdom should look at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. And now, finally, uh, Sayyid uh, John Hop Bryant. Uh, you have 10 minutes, John. Please. My, my goal is for you not to have to tell me that I've got a minute left. So I don't normally use remarks, but uh, I've got some notes to keep this crisp. First of all, thank you, moderator, and the Jeddah Forum and the Chamber, and my friends at Setco Holdings, for which is my lead partner here in, uh, in Saudi, for um, your support here today. Let me start by saying that I, I grew up in a poor neighborhood. I was homeless for six months of my life when I was 18 years old. Uh, today, I lead an organization, Operation Hope, that's invested through our partners, uh, $2 billion U.S. <laughs> All of that invested profitably in so-called poor and underserved neighborhoods. All of it. We raised credit scores 120 points in America over 18 months, which is transformational for somebody's life. Now, my point there is rainbows only follow storms. You cannot have a rainbow without a storm first. So let's deal straight with the challenges in front of us and see them through the lens of, pro of opportunity. Gallup says that by the year 2045, global GDP will be, two, uh, tw will be $200 trillion. Global GDP right now is about $62 trillion, give or take. America has a quarter of that. The only question, is who gets $140 trillion? That's the long goal, because you cannot be a world leader or any other kind of leader unless you're an economic leader. You're almost at, a, at $1 trillion here in Saudi Arabia. How do we double that? I have five very crisp, what I call big bangs, for Saudi and MENA region growth. Here they are. Number one, demographics are destiny. It's like your personal GPS system. 60% of the population of Saudi Arabia right now is under the age of 25. Right now. 60% of the regions, the MENA region's population by 2020 will be under the age of 25. Number two, by the way, most people see this as a, as a problem. I see it as an opportunity. Number two, jobs in the MENA region. Every respectable report you read articulates a need for 100 million jobs in the MENA region by 2020. Now, in 20, 2004, that'd be alarming. In 2010, that'd be scary. By 2014, it should be downright frightening. It's 100 million jobs. Where are they going to come from? Because they're not going to come from government, and they're not going to come from big business. They're going to come from going small. Third point, this is very interesting. Jobs in America, the largest economy in the world. Now, here's what we tell our kids in America. We tell our kids to go to public school, K through 12, middle school, elementary school, middle school, and high school. Go to college, which they should, get a degree. And then we tell them to go work for a big business or government, neither of which are hiring. Here's where jobs come from. 8% of all jobs in America come from government. About inverse from this region, by the way. 92% come from the private sector. There was a time when we were just like you. In 1974, I'm sorry, about 1974, 1980, 70% of all jobs in America came from big business, and 4% of all jobs came from one company, AT&T. Today, 70% of all jobs come from Businesses with 500 employees or less. Half of all jobs in the largest economy in the world come from employers with 100 employees or less. Even more interesting, 7 billion people on the planet, give or take. 300 million people in America. 26, 27 million businesses in America. Of that, only 6 million of those businesses create one employee or more. Of those, 974 employ 10,000 people or more. 
You can count them. I mean, you can name them. Wells Fargo, uh, J.B. Morgan Chase, uh, IBM, Google, Facebook. You can, you can literally name them. Less than 1,000. And they aren't hiring, generally speaking. So where do these jobs come from? They come from startups, shoot-ups, small businesses, businesses you're funding, entrepreneurs. Here's another interesting number. We have about 18,000 businesses that employ between 1,000 and 18,000 people. So the majority, the vast majority of all GDP in America comes from small businesses with 500 employees or less, and 70% of our economy is driven by consumer spending. Now, here's the investment bet for Saudi Arabia in the MENA region. It's your people, not oil. It's your people. It'll be led by your youth. It'll be led by you going small. If somebody told me uh, uh, yesterday, they went into a suit shop here, 10 rich people go into a suit shop, you buy 10 suits. But if you create a middle class and a working class and 50 people go in, you buy 50 suits. You also have a small business that makes the suit, that sells the suit, and cleans the suit. By the way, the suit that I'm wearing today was created by an entrepreneur that I put in business. We raised his credit score 120 points. We gave him $35,000 as a loan. He's now doing a million dollars in revenue and employing six people paying his taxes, raising his children, and, in, and adding to the economy. This is the vision right here in your region, uh, and I call it the investment plan for the future. I would do, if I were you, I would go into your public schools, and I'm wrapping up. I would open a Hope Business in a Box Academy in your public schools. I teach a kid a course in financial literacy, which is what we're doing with SEDCO, with Reali. That's your new civil rights issue. If you don't understand the language of money, financial literacy, and you don't have a bank account, you'll never prosper. The next thing I do is give them a course in dignity, values, then a course in entrepreneurship. Then we have 25 businesses you can start for $500 or less. It's about a little under 2,000 reali, real. Then we give them two minutes to pitch their business idea in front of a panel of judges. There's a timer. They pitch. Kids, the endorphins start firing in the right side of their heads. They're connecting education with aspiration. They're getting excited about their life. The most dangerous person is a person with no hope. Their hope is coming back. The judges pick one of the entrepreneurs or several. We fund the business. You then open a bank account to put the money in so they can't just go and run the money. Then you sign a business role model to them because life's all about role modeling. Why am I an entrepreneur? Because my father was. It's not role modeling. It's not role, it's not magic, it's role modeling. The book, The Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell, proved that at 5% role models, every community stabilizes. Not 80% role models, not 50% role models, not even 10, just 5% will stabilize any community. So then we would have Gallup measure the back-end impact, and from there you'd create jobs. Silicon Valley was referenced earlier in the remarks. In 1830, the richest, city, the richest state in America was Mississippi, slave economy. Today, the poorest city in Amer state in America is Mississippi. Silicon Valley saved America, which were all young people under the age of 45, creating the Facebooks, the Twitters, the YouTubes, and all the things that we take for granted today. And we're using all these devices created by young people who created $10 trillion in GDP out of an idea. This, the last thing I would recommend is in your bank branches, I'd put a hope inside or something like it. We're like a private banker to the working man. And we basically put our hands around their challenges, create opportunities, raise up their credit scores, raise up their self-esteem, their financial IQ, and prepare them with confidence to go into the economy. There's nothing wrong with Saudi Arabia. There's nothing wrong with the MENA region. And there's nothing wrong with your kids. It's a crisis of virtues and values. And all you've got to do is reimagine it. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. والله رفع معنوياتنا لأنه نحتاج الأمل ونحتاج الثقة وجون يمكن بالذات للشباب والشابات يعني نرجو أن يكون زي مشاعرهم تحمل نفس مشاعر سيد جون في عملية بناء المستقبل من لا شيء فعندنا ست دقائق للأسئلة والأجوبة فهاعطي للقسم النساء سؤال وقسم الرجال سؤال 
وبعدين حندخل ندخل على الفوتنج فنبدا بالليديز فيرست اذا في اسئله من قسم النساء لو سمحتوا كويس ما في ولا سؤال من النساء شكرا اه اوكي في سيده هنا تفضلي تعرفي باسمك لو سمحتي ولا الجهه اللي انت منها Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Arabic. Shukran, it's me, uh, Hala, and I'm from Jordan. In English, I can understand. Ah, in English. Thank you. My name is Hala. I'm from Jordan. I started my life uh, working in the economic sector and moved to development. And now I work on women and youth empowerment. You mentioned something quite uh, interesting at the end, and I, and I uh, having my question directed to all the panel, but especially our last speaker about virtue, crisis of virtues and values. And I'd like to hear more about how do you see reintegrating the value of hard work, the value of equality, justice, and, and the issues that are really into our culture, back for youth who, I, I fully agree with you, there's nothing wrong with our youth, it's us not giving them the right vehicles to bring the best in them. And in, in that case, I agree. So that's my question. Thank shukra, you. Shukra. John, I think that that question is related to you. What would you ask her uh, to uh, do? First of all, I, I admire her uh, boldness in, 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 in stating, uh, stating that. Let me say that America made this mistake. Most of these mistakes are made with good intentions. Uh, after the problems with slavery and other things, discrimination, we gave American, we were talking about this, we gave American blacks, uh, as an example, uh, welfare. We put them to sleep. Good intentions. Put an entire generation to sleep because you can't give somebody hope. You can't give somebody self-esteem. You can't give somebody the work ethic. You've got to instill that in them. And so I would say there's a difference between being broke and being poor. Being broke is economic, but being poor is a disabling frame of mind, a depressed condition of your spirit, you must vow never to be poor again. And I would suggest very respectfully that Saudi Arabia has done a beautiful thing in trying to make sure that people are okay, but they've done too much. You have not allowed your young people to suffer for the good, to struggle. If they want to go to school, here's some money. You want a loan, here's some money. You want to go shopping, here's some money. You, you, you don't want to work, here's some money. You, you, you're putting their values to sleep. And you've got to wake them up. There's nothing wrong with these kids. They are dying to live, to contribute, but they don't know how. And it's what you don't know that you don't know that's killing you. And so it's really just about going and, and, and embedding the core values back into society that they were born with in the first place. Essentially what I'm saying is your job is to reintroduce people to themselves, reintroduce people back to their core nature, which is to work. اوكي ثانك يو قسم الرجال في في الاخير نعطي فرصه في الاخير الشباب تفضل اللي هناك ونرجع لك ان شاء الله عندنا دقيقتين زياده حنجمع سؤالين بعدين نعطي الاجوبه للاخوان السلام عليكم شكرا جزيلا ماي نيم از عدنان اليوسف ام فروم كولجز اوف اكسلنس كولجز اوف اكسلنس فيري كويك اتس ا نيو بروجكت from the government, which is um, uplifting the Tibet uh, education here in Saudi Arabia, technical vocational educational training. So um, I, I, I want to get some suggestions from you uh, since we just started last year. Um, what is, how can we encourage our new students uh, to be entrepreneur? So uh, what, how is the ways, what, is, what, what should we do to encourage these students? We have now uh, 7,000 uh, students and um, we have 10 colleges and this year we're going to have another 27 um, new colleges, and we're going to bring it up to 150 by 2023. Um, one part is actually to, to bring um, skilled Saudis uh, to the market, uh, plus we want to create the entrepreneurs. So what, what's your best suggestions for us to, to put it uh, uh, for our students? Okay, shukran, shukran. Tafadal akhina, but then I think uh, uh, Joanna okay. can answer it, and. Uh, Ed, yeah. Uh, please. Uh, you know, oh, one of the things that uh, I uh, we will we're we're will collect more questions okay. because we're short of time. Yeah. Can you make it quick, please, and pass it over to the person next to you, please. Uh, 
I, I, I'll, I'll make it quick, but <clears throat> with the respect of being uh, attached to the community, I would uh, address my issue to the bankers that we have here. Unfortunately, that's bankers all over the world. They're trying to do as much as they can to the communities, and they're trying to do to upscale to those juniors who would like to participate in the development in the countries. For instance, I'm a UN staff, where I used to work in Nairobi, Kenya for two years, and I find out that Charter Bank there, they are doing a hell of a good business to the community, to the smaller people who they would like to have their own help in their countries. I'm afraid that neither Charter or neither uh, NCP or others who are, they are in the countries, they are not trying to support the, 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 the cycle of how this, the new generation can be as a participant to assist uh, at least the development of the country and also to wave out the, the old mentalities and back up the compound of how they can upgrade our need for the future okay. of this country. All Thank right. you. Shukran. Yeah, pass it over to the person next to you, please. Immediately, then we'll have answers, and that's it. Can you make it quick, please? Sure. Faisal Abbas from Al Arabiya English. My question is for John, and I just want to follow up on the comment from the ladies section where she said the problem is actually um, in the parents. Um, you have a book called Le uh, Love Leadership, John, and you were talking about the solution is not giving our children or our youngsters more money. Uh, unfortunately, we've come, to, you know, we've become so spoiled that, you know, we've turned giving money to somebody as a, uh, as a sign of uh, admiration and sign of love. The now, the question yeah, is, how do we reverse that? Because okay. I've, I've attended, um, I've attended your speak, speech last year um, uh, here in Jeddah, uh, and you were talking that we need to prepare for a day when, you know, possibly the economy won't be as good as it is today, and if we continue this way, we won't be ready. So is it too late to kind of reverse that kind of psychological thing about giving money as a way of uh, love and uh, actually uh, bestow uh, the love of creating money instead of just uh, taking it without any value? Shukran, Jazeera. Uh, Joanne, first, then I will ask uh, Dr. Saeed. Uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll give each one of you one I'll, minute. I'll try to answer actually yeah, the please. first and the last a little bit too. So in terms of uh, inspiring people to become entrepreneurs, have entrepreneurs come speak. Um, at your school, I would also create a class in entrepreneurship. I would try to create internships where students can then work in early stage companies and get, you know, the kind of the hands on feel of what it's like to be in a startup. And to the point of how you inspire the next generation, uh, one thing that we do with Endeavor is we make sure our entrepreneurs give back. In order to get all of the resources of Endeavor that Endeavor has, you have to give a piece of your equity back to the local office in order to help the next next generation. And what we find is our entrepreneurs who have success then become the leaders, the funders, the mentors of the next generation. Thank you, Reid. Dr. Said. Sure. Uh, regarding the question that came from the gentleman on the role of the banks, and I would talk about NCB in particular. In 2004, we established a unit in the bank <coughs> called Corporate Social Responsibility Unit, or department actually. And what we've done over the years is we partner with chambers of commerce across the kingdom in training young Saudis, males and females, and how to start their businesses. And there are hundreds of them, and some of them made successful businesses. So we already started with that. We also uh, work with what we call it al-usr al-muntija, or productive families. We provided small financing to some of the families that are in need. And we bought whatever products they produce because we designed what they should be producing. And we bought it from them in order to assess them in being able to market their products. Thank so you. we're doing some of our shares in yeah. contributing to the community. Cloud, please. I would like just to, to mention one thing. If you want people to be entrepreneurs, put them in contact with some people who have succeeded in their enterprise and you will create immediately a reaction among many people who will be very simple why not me we have seen the power of example the power of emulation 
I think it is a matter of putting people in contact with success. Success is very contagious. Bravo. Potros? Uh, I'd like to uh, say a couple of words regarding the entrepreneurship. I mean, I went to school at MIT, and it's known for its uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, you, you know, efforts. One thing that is very tangible, get students to compete you know, at the school level with some projects, ideas, develop them, and then you get VCs to come and listen and see what kind of ideas, plans exist. And the VCs in general support a lot of the projects uh, and eventually will take it through. And once you see the success breeds success and... Uh, thank you, Patrice. Thank you. Uh, Quick. Yeah, yeah the, the, a perfect example, the U.S. Saudi Arabian Business Council over the last three years has had the privilege of organizing tours within the U.S. <coughs> for the Prince Salman Young Entrepreneurs Award. And as a result of that, there have been not only networking uh, and exposure to other entrepreneurship systems, but also actual deals. So the Khan Academy signed with Prince Salman uh, Young uh, uh, Center, Youth Center, uh, a contract which came out of those visits. So I would encourage exchanges uh, with, with, uh, with other countries, other entrepreneurships uh, within Thank other you. countries. John, final cheerful comment, please. Cheer the, the youth up. Let them have a bright future, please. Yeah, so, with your thoughts. Uh, I, I said uh, rainbows follow storms. You cannot have a rainbow uh, storm first. Nobody changes in good times. Why would you? You only change in bad times. The demographics of your region will force uh, you to, to deal with things differently. And when Saudi Arabia started giving these, uh, these monies to underprivileged people and others, you had a few million people. Now you have almost 28 million. You literally can't afford it for very long. And there's a Citigroup report that was out last year that showed that by, in 35 years, you have the risk of being a net oil importer. Those three facts, those trends, will force you to reimagine how you treat each other, how you love each other, how you share, appreciate each other. And uh, basically, writing a check to somebody is a lazy man's version of real love. You have a chance to get it right, and I think that Saudi Arabia in particular has a chance for the entire region to be a, a, better, a, a bit of a beacon of hope uh, for this generation that is just thriving and striving and desiring to be just like you. And the road about mentoring and role modeling is absolutely the key. I would challenge, as a closing comment, 5% of businesses in the MENA region to be create an unpaid business uh, internship. 5% of businesses that create an unpaid business internship, you'll turn the entire situation around. Because all a kid wants is a good job or a shot at economic opportunity. And that will connect education with aspiration. Thank you, John. That's a very good closing. شكراً أخوان في عندنا خمسة أسئلة نبغى تفاعلكم معها خمسة أسئلة حتكون على الشاشة في تصويت تصويت حيكون معكم كل تصويت حيكون ثلاثين ثانية أو خمسة عشر ثانية. Well as well. Well, we need this voting. Well, we need the voting. It's not on yet. Okay. Shall we? First one, please. Saudi Arabia is an attractive for business investment. Please say yes or no. One voter only. Come on. No. <laughs> Two, three voters. One. I need to see more. There you go. All right. Give us the result, please. Okay, 65% uh, agrees and 35% disagree. Okay, the second question is, the financial services uh, sector uh, provides uh, sufficient support for SMEs, <laughs> business, uh, size, size businesses. Do you agree or you disagree? We need your vote. Ladies, we need your vote. SMEs, support, finance. Do you get enough finance? Only two voters. 
Six quarters. 40. 32. 40. 50 quarters. All right, we're going good. 62 quarters. Okay. Close it. Let's have the result, please. Wow. 29% disagree. Oh, agree, sorry. 71% uh, disagree. So financial uh, services are not supported. Third one. Youth will... Re with youth representing uh, the majority of the population, is this true? So, uh, yeah, finally, I see it here. I need your vote. With youth representing the majority of the population, is it the positive or negative? 16. I need more. I need 70. Last record was 64. Three more, 70. We need three more votes. <laughs> All right, close it at this level. What is the result? Yes, positive, 86%. Yay. Says yes and 14% uh, uh, negative. All right, the uh, fourth question. Is the future of Saudi Arabia dependent on, uh, actually, on big business uh, growth or small and medium business growth. Please only press button one or two. Please only press the button once the light turns green when your uh, vote is received. So I need votes here, please. We need to reach that 70. 27 so far, 33, 36, 44. Still need more, more votes. Gone. All right, I need the result. 29% big business growth, 71% say small and medium business growth. And this is very encouraging because it shows that SMEs are a major part of our business society. The final question, Saudis are exposed to business opportunities. Do you agree on this? Do you have the opportunity to, uh, to, to get business uh, through uh, uh, any other media other than uh, just getting into by luck. I need votes here, especially from youngsters and ladies, of course. Only four votes so far. What a shame on this question. Do you get business opportunities? I mean, that do you get the uh, exposure through business? Do you get business from ideas, from studies, from media? Fifty-five. Okay, close it. Uh, Twenty-nine percent agree and disagree. Seventy-one percent. With that, thank you very much. I think we're close here. And uh, please give me a big applause for our al alhadirin wal mutahdithin. Shukran li sabrukum alayna wa shukran li taawunkum. Shukran lak, Sayyid Omar Ahmed Bahlew, ala idarat hadi al jalsa wa shukran aydan li mushaarikin fiha wa kan al hadith an tamkin. إنشاء الروابط بين المستثمرين وقطاع الأعمال أتمنى منكم البقاء على المسرح وأتمنى من نائب رئيس مجلس إدارة الغرفة التجارية والصناعية بجدة سيد مازن بترجي التكرم بتوزيع هدية تذكارية على السادة المشاركين في هذه الجلسة وحتى انتهاء التكريم فقط مشير إلى نقطة مهمة تتعلق بجهاز بوكن
وهو هذا الجهاز الذي تستطيعون استلامه من المدخل الرئيسي لهذه القاعة وبإمكانكم التصويت والمشاركة الفاعلة في كل جلسات هذا المنتدى لهذا العام المشاركين مواضيع الحلقات أو الجلسات بإمكانكم مباشرة أخذ هذا الجهاز ليكون طريقة تعريفكم وبطاقتكم التعريفية وبإمكانكم الاحتفاظ بهذا الجهاز والمشاركة بفاعلية في المنتدى لهذا العام كما أشرت بإمكانكم الحصول على هذا الجهاز من المدخل الرئيسي للقاعة وبإمكانكم الاحتفاظ به طبعا هذا الجهاز هو البوكن يختلف تماما عن الجهاز الآخر الذي تصوتون به الآن هذه الأجهزة الأخرى لابد من إعادتها مرة أخرى لكي نستفيد منها مباشرة بعد كل جلسة سنتوقف الآن لاستراحة قصيرة سنعود في تمام الساعة الخامسة عصرا في جلسة سيكون فيها العديد من المفاجآت والإحصائيات فيما يتعلق بتوظيف الشباب في الخليج العربي سيقدم هذه الجلسة سيد جيرارد جالاجر وهو قائد الاستشارات في منطقة الشرق الأوسط بشركة أرنست أند يونغ نراكم رجاءً في تمام الساعة الخامسة <تصفيق>